Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, health forum for, uh, I'll use Christine's title, we, we call it Caring for Ourselves by Caring for Environment. And you can see Christine's title on the screen. But I would love to welcome our speaker, Ms. Christine McCoy, who is from the DC Department of Public Works, and she has a 25 years of experience in all things of waste reduction and recycling, reusing, and uh, just reducing our footprint. And we'd love to hear what she has to say. I know she has a wealth of knowledge. She could talk about this all day, but we won't <laughs> do that to you. <laughs> and we will record what she's saying so that you can see it later on as well as share it with others. We're doing this program, the Health Services Office, and I neglected to introduce myself, Dr. Sandra Charles of the Health Services Office. And we're doing this in collaboration with my colleague, LeMoyne Blackshear, the Chief of Facilities. And um, recycling is very near and dear to us because uh, funds that we get from anything that we recycle go towards our wellness program. And that is a primary uh, objective of ours to enhance wellness and promote health and wellness. So it all ties together. And part of our wellness is our environment and how, where we have to work, where we have to live. And Christine has many ideas today that will get us thinking about what we're doing and also motivated to maybe recycle a little bit more and not decide to just throw it all in the trash. Or worse yet, throw the trash in the recycling container because then everything gets messed up. So without further ado, I will introduce Christine. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, yeah, so I work for the District of Columbia's Office of Waste Diversion, which is under the Department of Public Works and the Director's Office. Um, I have been doing this for quite some time. So I came to the district back in September. Um, I had worked for the Fairfax County uh, solid waste management program prior to that, and I've worked for the National Recycling Coalition, the American Forest and Paper Association, the City of Alexandria, and a bunch of other people. So, um, yeah, I've been doing this a long time. All right, so we're going to talk about source reduction and reuse first. Now, I will uh, say that the Office of Waste Diversion is uh, partners with the Department of en Energy and the Environment, and the Department of Energy and the Environment is mainly responsible for our source reduction programs. Um, so the first thing is that they have a <coughs> source reduction and reuse efforts. So we've been celebrating the plastic bag ban um, and so single use plastics. We instituted a five cent bag fee and um, in the last 10 years, we've helped to reduce plastic pollution in the environment um, by having this five cent fee. And um, since 2010, the bag law has generated more than $19 million in revenue um, to use in the district to help with environmental programs. We have reduced 700, uh, sorry, sorry 70,000 tons or pounds, excuse me, of trash and debris that was removed through the installation of seven trash traps in the district waters. Uh, we have had more than 300, or sorry, 3,000 trees planted and installed of over 2,300 rain barrels in to capture stormwater. Um, and then we've had 29,000 linear feet of restored streams as a result of this program. Oops. I was told not to knock that out, and I just did it. So sorry about that. Um, and five facts to celebrate five years of the foam ban, the styrofoam ban was great. And that <coughs> mean, uh, excuse me, meant that the foam, in the foam ban's first year, the portion of foam lo in local trash traps fell by more than half from 15% in 2015 to 7% in 2016. Um, over a 10 year period, the proportion of foam in local trash Traps went down 24% in 2010 to just 3% in 2020. Um, compliance rates for the district's businesses jumped from 60% in 2015 to 96% in 2020. And 45,000 pounds of trash and debris have been captured in local trash traps since 2016. 
The district is one of 100 plus jurisdictions nationwide with some form of ban on foam. Oh my goodness. And so here's some char a chart that explains the impact of foam-free DC. This graph shows average breakdown of types of litter captured in the Nash Run trash trap each year from 2010 to 2020. These numbers are similar to other areas other area rivers and streams and show the decline in foam in the five years since the foam ban took effect. So yay, reducing trash in the environment, which is in, really important. And then they also, DOEE is in charge of the um, banning of straws. And um, they basically banned plastic straws and stirrers to help reduce plastic waste and litter that pollutes the district communities and waterways. Plastic straws and stirs are easily blown and washed into local waterways where they can remain for hundreds of years before breaking down. So reusable straws is the way to go. Additional programs to support source reduction and reuse. Um, they have a ditch the disposables program as part of Zero Waste DC, which aims to reduce the use of disposable foodware by providing grants to support transition to reusable foodware at restaurants and food serving entities. This can include establishing dishwashing capacity and implementing the reuse of reusable containers either in-house or through a third party entity. And then we also have the Fix It DC clinics, which are great community repair events dedicated to charging, changing a throwaway mentality so people can bring clothing or appliances or other items that can be fixed at these workshops. And they can also learn how to do that themselves. So Reuse DC is the district's hub for learning where to repair, donate, and shop secondhand household items. And search online, and a search an online directory to explore how to exchange items with your neighbors. Um, and uh, so there's other groups, online groups and Facebook groups that can help you also uh, exchange and reuse your items locally. So here's our Office of Waste Diversion Voluntary Programs, the benefits of diverting food waste. So we're getting into food waste diversion. It's been coming for a few years here in the, in the, in the region. Um, Arlington County started collecting food scraps uh, curbside. We're going to start doing that. We have a pilot program that will be launched in the next couple months. And um, obviously there's many benefits of diverting food waste like Compo composting does not produce methane, a greenhouse gas. Compost is used to fertilize soil on farms and in public gardens, public parks and gardens. Um, it helps keep rats out of the trash, believe it or not. We think that collecting food waste separately will help actually reduce the rat population. Um, many smaller scale composting efforts are led by community groups and a great way to meet your neighbors. Um, composting your food scraps and waste can help shed light on how much waste you're actually producing as a household. And even if they aren't composted in the traditional sense, diverted food waste can be used to make and create renewable energy through anaerobic digestion. Oops, I did it again. I'm so sorry. Yes, of course. Um, I'm a DC resident. Yes. Uh, but I live in a condo building, so like our trash isn't picked up by DC. It's obviously contracted. Right. Um, so things like composting and food scraps like compost. I'm, I'm interested in that. I live in Cleveland Park. We compost at our uh, farmer's market. Mm -hmm. We compost. Um, so I'm interested, though, for places like that that are condo buildings that aren't necessarily yeah. using DC services for those types of things. Would there be options? You would have to talk to your property manager and you would have to contract with a private collector to do that. And then I had one other question mm -hmm. about, um, you know, during the pandemic time, we did way more takeout, way more um, reusable, or not non-reusable, but, you know, like uh, disposable um, restaurant where, I guess. Um, has, has there been, uh, the data went up to 2020, so obviously it didn't really probably capture a lot of that, but did you see a lot more waste um, issues or anything like that or increases in, in, uh, in just bulk trash, that kind of stuff during the pandemic? 
Mm, I think it just switched from being commercial to residential, essentially. You know, it wasn't a, a huge change in the waste stream that I'm aware of. Um, the unfortunate thing is most of those takeout containers are not recyclable. Yeah. It's unfortunate. So, you know, trying to reduce the use of those items as much as possible mm -hmm. is helpful. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, um, we were just talking about the curbside composting pilot program, which is basically going to be provided to residents who get our services, and those are going to be single family homes up to three units. Um, and so we have about 9,000 people signed up. It was going to be originally 12,000, but we had some issues with having people opt in to this program. But um, we're basically going to have at least 1,000 people per ward involved. and. Um, in fact, we closed the signups for that actually May 26th. I forgot to change that in the presentation. So um, right now, we anticipate that the program will start probably in late August. And all households will receive a starter kit. They'll get a curbside collection container, a kitchen caddy, and 100 compostable bags or liners. Um, and then we'll be tracking the tonnage collected and diverted, participation, that means how often is a container set out, contamination rates, service requests, so, you know, did we miss your collection, was your container lost or broken, um, evaluating, a, excuse me, evaluating a processing capacity within the region. So in the region, we have three facilities that accept food waste for uh, diversion. So we have Prince William County and Prince George's County composting facilities, and then there's an anaerobic digestion facility in Jessup, Maryland as well. So again, you know, this is how it's going to work. You're going to basically have your kitchen caddy on your countertop or you can put it in your refrigerator to help eliminate smells and fruit flies. And you line that with a um, biodegradable bag. You fill it up with food scraps, which is basically going to involve any vegetative waste. It's also going to include meat, bones, and dairy, dairy products as well. You put that bag into your curbside collection container, which is basically a five-gallon uh, paint bucket with a screw top lid, and you set that out uh, for collection weekly. And I think it's going to be on the same day as your recycling. I'm not certain, but um, that's essentially what we've been talking about, is that it will collect it the same day as your recycling. So it's not necessarily a joint venture, um, but we do pay disposal fees to those two sites where where we do take it, yeah. So the idea is that we are actually going to be, um, we're, we're renovating Benning Road and it's gonna become a resource recovery park. Um, eventually it should actually, act, actually also have a materials recovery facility so that way when we do our recycling we'll actually be making revenue on our processing of our recycling. Okay. So what can you compost? So those are the things that you can compost, the yes lists, fruits, vegetables, scraps, and trimming. <laughs> He's going to make it idiot-proof for me. Sorry, y'all. Um, <laughs> cut or dried flowers and plants, coffee grounds, loose tea and paper tea bags and filters. Be careful with tea bags. A lot of them are actually made out of um, plastic. So uh, yeah. And then meat, bone, eggs, and dairy. Eggshells, nutshells, and corn cobs, bread, grains, cereals, rice, pasta, nuts, beans, flour, spices, food soiled napkins and paper towels, and BPI certified compostable bags. And the other things that we don't want is yard waste, fats, oils, and grease, plastic, metal foil, glass, foam, and coated or waxed paper, plastic bags, wraps, or film, which you can recycle, just not in your curbside bin. If you want to uh, recycle plastic film, take it to the grocery store. They have a, a bin usually in the entryway that you can put that in, okay? Um, compostable cups, straws, takeout containers and utensils, animal waste, diapers, disease or insect, or insect infested house plants, invasive plants or contaminated soil. So we plan to, we have a food waste drop off program currently. So I think you were talking, you participated in that. That's at your farmer's market. We have 10 of these food waste drop-off locations throughout the city. And um, we intend on adding 
uh, up to, we're gonna have a 16 in the end when we're done, but we'll have two in each ward. Um, and uh, many of these are gonna be in high density areas. Since we're gonna start probably providing the residential collection, then we're gonna uh, make sure that these food waste drop-offs are in high dense areas where people are in condos or apartment buildings and things like that. Yeah. I'm not sure how it works for, oh, you've got the drop off right there. Um, so I drop it off on the weekends. Um, are, will this expand like the days that it's available? So it's possible. Um, we do think we want to expand to uh, some weekdays, especially like Eastern Market is so jammed up on Saturdays that it gets crazy and we're trying to alleviate some of those issues. The other thing is we actually just got a donation of a bin that is, it contains a 35 gallon cart and it's lockable and we can give people a code so that they can get to it at any time of the day or week or whatever. Um, and we're gonna, I haven't figured out where I'm putting that because it's kind of too small. I was gonna put it at Easter Market but I wanted a 65 gallon container, not a 35. So we have to find a place that's gonna have enough interest but not overwhelm it that I have to have it collected every day. So, <laughs> Lincoln Park. It's probably not going to be. It's probably going to, yeah. So, um, but we're what we may test out more of these bins as well as well as we move forward. But we were, I was at the Waste Expo and these guys were selling these because what's happening now is especially because of rats in very urbanized areas, they're trying to containerize the waste more than just having it in a cart. So they have these steel cases that they're a couple different uh, manufacturers are making now. So that's what we have, we're gonna give it a test run and see how it goes, um, but yeah. So in addition to that though, we also have these um, markets where the um, drop-offs are located. And we've actually diverted over 460 tons of material, which is amazing. Are the hotels participating in this? So we have a rule now too, and I'm gonna talk about that as uh, our commercial requirements, okay? so we passed the Zero Waste Omnibus, Omnibus Act of 2020, and uh, basically that act requires entities that produce food waste to start diverting it. So it's a phase-in process right now. This year it's four colleges and universities and 47 retail stores or grocery stores. And so <coughs> we're working on um, getting out a toolkit to them um, so that they have more information about how they can divert food waste. But basically, we require them to initially donate as much as excess food as they can, um, then source separate back of house uh, commercial food waste, and also um, think about some, uh, some restaurants and food waste generating entities are actually composting on site. They have in-vessel composting systems, which work pretty well. That's what this is here um, on the both ends of the <laughs> pictures. Those are on-site systems. So the closing loop, this is actually Equinox Restaurant. And then this one on um, the right is uh, at the Arc, which is actually DC uh, Central Kitchen. And then this gentleman here is actually doing vermicomposting, which is worm composting. And um, this picture here is actually American University separating their food scraps from their dining hall. All right, so who needs to participate? Again, I was saying the colleges and universities, it's over 2,000 residential students and uh, the food stores with over 10,000 square feet of retail space. And then in 2024, it'll be retail food stores not covered in 2023 and then who operates stores under com common ownership with three or more retail stores and with floor area of at least 10,000 square feet. Then we're gonna have arenas and stadiums, which is basically just the Nat Stadium and the soccer stadium with at least 15,000 uh, seats, hospitals and nursing homes with at least 300 beds, and then colleges and universities with at least 500 residential, <coughs> residential students, which basically is just Catholic University is the only one that <clears throat> meets those minimum requirements. And just so you know, this is actually a picture of the Prince George's County composting facility, and they have these gore cover systems which help to process the material more quickly. 
and helps the material degrade. And this is a picture of when they added food scraps to their processing facility. All right, so the covered entities for this year, they've been notified via email, and we are also considering a phase in for additional um, entities. So for example, the Zero Waste Omnibus Act does not mention restaurants. So we have to actually go back. And in 2024, they say the mayor can designate additional entities. So we're working on a phase in of the, those additional entities over time. Um, we've been conducting site visits to confirm participation in diversion programs and to provide education and recommendations with how to comply with these requirements. The Office of Waste Diversion is developing a, a guidance document to assist uh, entities with how to implement those programs. And we are also working on a food waste ready training and certification program for uh, food waste staff or for people who work in the food waste industry or food industry, <laughs> food service industry, so that they can learn how to source separate um, food scraps for uh, digest anaerobic digestion or compo composting. And that's all I have for today. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. So the composted material is actually um, sold in garden stores. So if you see uh, leaf grow in garden stores, that's what PG County makes. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of curious your perspective on plastic recycling because the news has been kind of discouraging about where it actually goes, how much is recycled, and you know I think yeah. part of the part of the puzzle here is that the producers and the companies and the you know I guess what I'm trying to say is the private sector I think needs to reform how it does packaging, but until there's incentives to make them use more you know friendly products, they're not going to do it because the other stuff is cheap. So anyway, that's my little soapbox. But I just want to hear your perspective, like. How much of our stuff is actually recycled? How can we be better plastic recyclers? Like, do we need to clean it? Do we need the So the unvarnished truth is that the only plastics that are actually recyclable are numbers one and two, and they have to be in bottle and jug form. Uh, the other plastics we were sending to China, and they basically said, no, we don't want your stuff anymore, because they were basically ending up having to dispose of it anyway. So, yeah, the depressing news is that's basically what's happening right now in terms of markets for these commodities. And you have to think of these things as commodities that are, you know, bought and sold and traded. So what's happening is the industry is looking to do what they call paralysis, which is for plastics three through seven, uh, to turn them into a wax and a fuel. Um, and that's kind of taking hold lately because there seems to be more investment in this type of um, processing capacity. So the fear is is that um, that unfortunately some of the plastics that are recyclable may end up being used in for the paralysis stuff, um, which is not the highest and best use of the material necessarily. So we're going to see how that all shakes out. Um, but really, yeah, it's unfortunate. Just when it comes to plastics, think of it as you know, just try and reduce as much as you possibly can. Try and be thoughtful about what you're taking in as plastics. You know, we get those takeout containers all the time, and I'm sure a lot of people get rid of them, and we reuse them for, you know, lunches and things. But we also give out, you know, the extra ones that we have to the American Legion because people are, instead of balancing plates to take home food or whatever, they can take a takeout container. So you just have to really be thoughtful about it. It's unfortunate, but that's really what the, st the status is or, or whatever right now in terms of what the options are for these types of things. And if you think about it too, you're, they're sorting for the things that we generate in the largest quantities typically. So it's soda bottles, water bottles, laundry detergent, shampoo bottles, those kinds of things. If it's not one or two? Oh, sorry. Yeah. And the problem with the clamshells that are made out of one is that those are form molded, not blow molded, so they have a different melt temperature. And I will tell you that you're right. It's the plastics industry who has perpetrated the ruse on the public forever and ever by putting those recycling, chasing arrows around the numbers, which is basically a resin code. It tells you what type of plastic it is. It does not connotate recyclability at all. So it's really 
a shame. But I think the Californians Against Waste have been trying to sue them to get that, them to change it for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bottles and jugs for mm -hmm. one. Um, so I've heard different things. When um, when the caps are on bottles, do you leave the cap on? So leave it on if you away? want it to be recycled. Leave it on if you want. If you don't want it, just throw. You have a choice. You can either leave it on or throw it in the trash because it's too small to be processed if it's not attached to the bottle. Okay. Okay. Um, and then um, could you talk about like aluminum and paper? What's yeah. useful Al to recycle? Aluminum is like highly recyclable, very valuable as a material. Paper is the largest uh, recyclable material in the recycling stream. So it's about anywhere from 50 to 70% of the recycling stream is paper, especially now. It used to be, you know, when we had newspapers <laughs> that that was a huge component of the recycling stream but people don't read newspapers in you know print form anymore typically so corrugated cardboard has taken over in terms of it being the monstrous thing that you find in recycling these days and I was wondering too like in terms of boxes and, and cardboard and paper um, like how much the labeling affects don't, don't worry about any of that okay. so what happens when you take paper and you recycle it so if it has if it has like tape or whatever, it'll float to the top because it's basically going to go into a bath and just going to agitate it so the fibers come loose. And so you're basically anything that's metal, staples and things like that will fall to the bottom and the plastic stuff will float to the top and then they just take all that great stuff in the middle to make new paper. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Sure. That makes me feel much better. I just moved, so I have to <laughs> some boxes. Understood. Any other questions? So it may be difficult for you to respond for other jurisdictions, but I'm curious. The things that are or are not recyclable do not vary by jurisdiction. Not really, no. Typically not. Um, there are some exceptions maybe based on geography, you know, in terms of what th people can accept. Um, but typically it's pretty basic that everybody's essentially recycling the same thing. Now, the MRFs, the material, the people who own and operate the MRFs will tell you that all plastics are recyclable. And they'll take them, but they won't necessarily have a use for them. But they're trying to also compete with their other materials recovery facilities. So um, if you really drill down and ask them what, you know, what type of plastics they take they'll, and which, what's being recycled, they'll say one and two. And you said that uh, detergent bottles fall in that classification? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the composting for people who want to compost at home. Oh, yeah. Between, you mentioned anaerobic and worm. Yeah, so vermicomposting and hot composting are the two at home types of composting that you can do. Um, I have a barrel, like the sauna, you know, uh, that is in my backyard. And I basically only put vegetative waste in there. You typically don't want to put any of your bone, meat, and dairy products in there because it'll attract rodents or other things. Um, so yeah, you can do that either in a static pile and you can turn it or you can have a, a tumbler, like I said, uh, that works really well so you can mix things. One of the things that people do a lot of is they make the mistake of putting in too much of the green stuff instead of the brown stuff. So you have to remember that your recipe is 70% carbon and 30% nitrogen. Nitrogen is like the vegetables and food scraps and things like that. Carbon is straw or cardboard or paper that's ripped up or leaves, dry fall leaves and things like that. So you need to make sure you stockpile the carbon sources so that you're not overwhelming it with the nitrogen because what happens is it just gets really wet and soggy and smelly and gross. So yeah, and the carbon helps absorb all that water. And then vermicomposting, I don't do vermicomposting, but you can get worms and they'll eat your food and poop and then they have great compost, right? So, but I haven't ever done it myself, um, but it works really well, as, you know, it's just in the, um, you know, I'm not sure about that. I don't think you need as much, I don't think you need as much carbon for vermicomposting. 
I guess I'm going to learn a little bit more about that this year. <laughs> yes? Is there a site that we can go to that would actually give us the instructions on how to compost with the carbon and green as you were just speaking on? So uh, I think we may have something online, and I'm not certain, but I'll actually uh, I'll talk to Carrie and get you guys a link to a, a site that'll explain how to compost. Yes. Um, sorry, one more question about the compost program. So, um, well, side note, I'm doing vermiculture. I've done it for several years. So if you want to talk later, I'm happy to <laughs> talk about my experience. I um, don't know how to get rid of fruit flies, so just you know, know that that's a risk in your house. If you <laughs> anyway, it's kind of fun to do. But my question about the pilot program is the pilot part. So a lot of my neighbors are really into gardening and they were so excited about this pilot thing. They were like so hyped about this pilot thing. And then we were kind of wondering like, is this pilot mean the city's gonna test it and like depending on the outcomes, they may or may not expand it like other municipalities. Like that's right. It's not a go. It's like you it's not a total green light, but we're yeah. working on it. And this is gonna help inform us about how much it's gonna cost us and mm -hmm. how much, you know, whether or not we need to contract it out, because this is gonna be a contracted service for okay. the pilot. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna be the ones collecting mm -hmm. the materials. So it's just gonna definitely help inform us about how much it will cost us to ultimately roll it out to uh, additional residents. In fact, hopefully, you know, all of the residents that we serve up to the three units. Cool, and then like one follow-up question. I'm just kind of curious, like, is there an argument like on the books, like financially for reducing through, comp you know, curbside composting, is there any kind of reduction on the waste um, management side of the Yeah, so, like so by diverting the food scraps, it's about 30% of our waste stream. I basically think of it in thirds, like the third of its food waste if, an, or, or organic material, yard waste included, and a third of its trash and a third of its recycling. So basically by, I think the tip fees around here are about $60 a ton for trash, and I think at the composting facilities, it's about $40 a ton. So there is definitely a, an economic argument to make that this will help us reduce the cost and also, you know, just increase our in environmental benefits <coughs> related to diverting the waste from disposal. In Prince George's County, they just started the composting program. Yeah. But it was never, uh, no, f no information was ever provided as to where the compost, would it ever be usable by the community? Is that the end goal for DC? So again, I think what's happening is we're processing these materials through uh, a facility that actually makes money on the sale of the materials. So it's not like we get the compost back. I know that has been a v big concern for residents saying, you know, great, I'm giving you my food scraps, now I want the stuff back, right? And we hope that eventually we will get into a situation to be able to offer that, but right now that's not gonna be the case, but it could be in the future, depending on how we work out the agreements with the facilities that process the material. Any other questions? I just wanted to ask our chief of facilities, who is responsible for coordinating her division, coordinating all of our efforts here at the library, to say a few words of the library's experience and Absolutely. how it ties in with what you've told us. So just for the library employees' knowledge, um, we do use IL Creations providing food services, and they provide uh, recyclable utensils and we're not using plastic straws anymore. We stopped that, DC started it. The other um, major contractor who works for us is Chimes. They do all of the cleaning and they do that uh, using recyclable, uh, they pick up our recycled paper products, you know, the three bins that you have. They have those uh, bins and they deliver them to the uh, loading dock, and GSA collects our recyclables and handles that. So we do have a small program for recycling. And then um, 
for our carpets. Uh, they are 100% recycled. And our furniture products, the new furniture products, mm -hmm. use recycled materials and can be recycled when we're done. That's the extent of our recycling <laughs> program. <laughs> so just to speak to that, our, our uh, bins say bottles and cans. But then in terms of the, well, the plastics, so that would mean that none of those plastic food containers should go into those bins. Is that correct? Outside of water bottles or other bottles. Not necessarily. Okay. <laughs> because the, um, some of the containers are uh, biodegradable. So IL Creations will take those, I was hoping to get some of that information, but they take that along with some food waste and they have a separate process. And I ask that question because I do know that sometimes I've heard, in fact, pretty recently that, uh, well, we wouldn't have fined, I don't suppose, but one, in one place people were fined because they contaminated the recycles, recyclables with, I guess, food waste. But I was just wondering if putting in other types of plastic would be considered a contaminated lot. And how it so would one thing that you want to do absolutely is make sure that you don't bag your recyclables. Um, plastic film in the s recycling stream is really detrimental um, in terms of it, because basically it gets tangled up on the equipment. So the first, very first step in sorting recyclables is to separate the paper from the containers. And they have these things called star screens that spin. And so anything that's, we call them tanglers, like hoses, wi hoses, wires, cords, plastic bags, that stuff gets tangled up on that equipment. And then they have to shut the facility down. And they have to manually strip away the plastic from those disks. And it's very costly. I remember us getting uh, literature from the county saying, do not put those, you know, those soft bags you put food and vegetables in the supermarket those none of those are wrappers plastic wrappers can go in the that's right has to go in the trash or take it to the or to the grocery drop off if it's not a biodegradable bag if it's actually plastic So shredded paper, unless it's going to a dedicated shredding service, is not really recyclable at curbside because if you think about it, it'll just go everywhere. Um, and those facilities are dusty enough, um, so it's basically like a confetti party if you try to recycle it. But you can put it in your compost bin. <laughs> it's a carbon source. It's a tree. It's made out of a tree. Uh, yeah, why not? I mean, yeah. I can't see any reason why that would be a problem. Any additional questions? Well, if we have no more questions, I would like to thank you wholeheartedly for this presentation. And I would be very remiss if I did not thank our nurse practitioner, Carrie Moore, who arranged this, contacted Christine and brought it to us. Carrie is our wellness, uh, main wellness advocate in the health services office. And we thank you very much, Carrie. And thank you so much, Christine. Thank you. This has been very informative. I look forward to reviewing the tape and sharing it with others when they, it's ready for us. So thank you so very much. Well, and thank thanks you. Thanks to DC and everyone.